All right. I think I mentioned this on Sunday morning, how I love singing the old ha- the songs, the, the, the hymns out of our songbook here, how they're packed full of good doctrine and stuff like that, you know, unlike the, the common and the, the, the contemporary Christian music of today that's just real generic and real plain, and anyone could listen to it and not be offended, and there's nothing really being taught or said. But the, the old songs that we sing is packed full of good doctrine. And um, I didn't mention this last week, but of course, the book of Psalms is a song book. These are, these are all songs. So when you read this, obviously this is scripture too. So it's God's holy word, but it's God's holy word compiled in a song book. And these were put to music. They were put to a melody. They had, they had rhythm. There, were, there was a way that these were sung when they were originally penned down. And it also consists of God's word. So, um, what, and what's great about the reason why I'm bringing this up is because we're going to be dealing with a couple of things that are that are very strong doctrinal issues tonight that come straight out of Psalm two, and these are referenced in the New Testament. You know, there's there's many, many, many references in the New Testament specifically to the Book of Psalms, and and Psalms are being quoted and referenced, and for good reason, because there, there is a lot of doctrine, and, and our music ought to reflect that. Our godly music, our psalms and hymns and spiritual songs ought to be, you know, teaching us, teaching one another in songs and hymns and spiritual songs, uh, singing with your heart unto the Lord, and um, it's important. So, so don't forget as we go through this, and I'm sure I'll bring references again as we go through chapter by chapter, that these are songs that were sung, and a lot of them will be like rejoicing songs and praising God. But specifically in this one, we're going to get into uh, a couple of, of key doctrinal issues that I want to hit. So let's get right into this. Verse number one of Psalm 2 reads, Why do the heathen rage, and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord, and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Now, keep your place here in Psalm 2 and turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 4. We're going to see where this is actually quoted in Acts chapter 4 of the heathen raging. Because this is brought up and is actually fulfilled and brought to pass. So not only are we going to be dealing with doctrine, the Psalms, the songs have good doctrine. They also have prophecy in them. This is something that is, is brought up and literally come to pass. This is, and this is basically, it's not just one specific prophecy, but this is basically the way that the world works. So this is, this is prophetic in the sense that it's repeated over and over and over again. And there's an example we're going to read in Acts chapter 4 where they specifically say, yeah, this is just like the rulers did. And as we get into Psalm 2, though, we're also, I also want you to pay attention because it's actually going to be referring to uh, prophecy of Jesus Christ's millennial reign. So just keep that in mind. We'll get into that in a little bit. But let's look at this example in Acts chapter 4 of where the heathen raged and where they took counsel together against Christ. So starting in verse number 13 of Acts chapter 4, the Bible reads, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John... And perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And beholding the man which was healed, standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, look at this, they conferred among themselves, which is just like the rulers taking counsel together in Psalm 2. That's what, what Psalm 2.2 2 talks about. It says, The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. And what's happening here is you have Peter and John and they healed a man. And, you know, and, and the miracle that was performed was undeniable. And they even recognize that. They're saying like, we know we could say nothing against this miracle. Everybody saw it. It's very public. And people are glorifying God and praising God that this man was healed. So they can't just come out and condemn it or speak against it or say that it wasn't real or anything like that because it is real. And this is the, this is, these are the wicked people. These are the heathen raging against God and, and will not listen to reason. And you would think 
if you see someone performing these miracles, preaching the word of God, just accept it that it's from God. You know, I mean, what needs to go through these people's heads? But they're maddened and sickened by the fact that they can't say anything against this because everything that's being done is good. And they're like, what, what are we going to do about this? So they go and they confer among themselves. They take counsel among themselves what they're going to do. Verse number 16 says, saying, what shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem and we cannot deny it. So we're stuck. We cannot deny that this happened. And everyone in Jerusalem knows about it. So what are we going to do about it? We can't just let this continue on. That's their mindset. They're raging against uh, God and against his servants. Verse number 17. But that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. See, they can't reason with them. They can't argue with them out of Scripture. They're in a totally losing uh, argument when it comes to just the truth and righteousness. So all they can do now is be evil and wicked and threaten them with physical harm. That's all they have. That's all they have left in their, in their, in their ammunition. They can't even lie about them because everyone knows and is seen and knows the truth. So all they can do is just threaten them. And keep that in mind. When you have the truth, and when the heathen's raging, this is all that they could ever possibly do. But you know what? Even the majority of time, the threatenings are just going to be talk. Most of the time. Now, did the, the apostles and the disciples suffer persecution? You bet they did. Was it always just talk when they threatened them? No, it wasn't. But didn't God still end up keeping them safe and protected ultimately? I mean, yeah, they might have had to suffer a little bit. They might have had to give some beatings. They might have gotten thrown into prison. But at the end of the day, they still continued preaching God's word and they still did the great work that God had for them. And ultimately, they were being protected from you know, being put to death unless they were being martyred for the glory of God. There was nothing that they had to be uh, afraid of. But this is the tactic that the, the heathen's going to use. The enemy's going to use is threaten, threaten, threaten. So let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. And the heathen is still trying to do this today. You've got wicked rulers. You've got wicked people that are raging and they're so angry against the God of the Bible and against Jesus Christ and against his followers that they are going to do anything and they're going to counsel together and and do whatever they can to stop what's being done for the Lord and, for, and, and against his anointed. Um, where we're, let's keep reading here. So they commanded him not to speak in verse number 18, verse number 19. This is the response. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done. And they, I love their answer. They're just like, if you think that we ought to listen to you more than we ought to listen to God, yeah, you could judge for yourself. Why, why don't you just figure that one out on your own, whether or not we're going to listen to you or whether or not we're going to listen to God? We have no respect for what you have to say when God's telling us to do something different. And we can't help but speak about the things that we've seen and heard. They were with Jesus Christ. They saw him crucified. They were with him and they saw him risen again from the dead. They say, we can't help but speak these things. We were there. We're eyewitnesses. We saw it. And if that brings blood upon your head, then so be it. But the truth is the truth and we can't help but speak it. And that's the, that's the attitude that we ought to have, by the way. Don't let anyone show you. Don't let anyone say, oh, well, you know, this says no soliciting. And, you know, people try to get you out. You're like, no. Look, I'm not going to listen to you more than I'm going to listen to God. God said preach the gospel to every creature. And that's what we're going to do. And if people get a little butthurt or offended by, by the, the five seconds it takes to go to your door and say I'm not interested, then Whatever. I don't care because I'm going to listen to God more than, than I'm going to listen to man. And that's what we're going to do here. 
whether legal or illegal, I mean, we're listening that God's laws come first every single time. Every single time. Now, we're not going out trying to cause trouble or mischief or anything like that. It's just, we're going to do what the Lord commanded us to do. And that's about mind. That's what the, the disciples said. And look, there was no problem except the people that hated God had a problem with them. There was no problem. What were they doing? Healing people? Oh, man, that's terrible. What were they doing? Preaching the truth? Preaching salvation? Yeah, what a horrible thing. We have to stop that. No, the only people that think that are really, really wicked people. Verse number 22, for the man was above 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing was showed. So they're saying that, you know, everyone knew about this because the guy was 40 years old already. And he had been, you know, in, in that condition for a really long time. I, I can't remember this specific example if it was his whole life or not. Um, I, think it might, I think it was. But um, anyway, let's keep reading here. Verse number 23, and being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. So this is talking about the disciples when the disciples were let go. After they were threatened and threatened and told to shut up, they go back to their own company with you know, the other believers. They go back to church, essentially, and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. So they're letting them know, hey, this is what they all said to us. This, this is what happened. They're telling the story, right? We got, you know, they arrested us, they threatened us, and they're, and they're relaying the story to them. Verse number 24, and when they heard that, so when they heard the story, when they heard everything that the chief priests and elders had said to them, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David hast said, so this is, the mouth of thy servant David is the psalm. It's Psalm 2 that we just read. Why did the heathen rage? And the people imagine vain things. The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. So they quote, they, they hear the story and they go, wow, God, that's amazing because you already have this written down in scripture and it's actually in Psalm 2 and they quote Psalm 2. And by the way, they knew the words to Psalm 2. When they heard the story, they put the scripture together. They didn't go, wait, I think I heard this before, and pull out a Bible and start looking for the chapter and verse. No, they knew it. You know how they knew it? Because they have it memorized. Because they meditated in God's word day and night, and they have the scripture in their heart. So when they hear these stories, they can make the application and say, wow, this is exactly like God said in Psalm 2. It's exactly like that scripture. This is what happened. The rulers were doing these things. The heathen is raging and they, they hear the story and they're like, That's exact, that is exactly what Psalm 2 says. And they knew it because it was in their heart. And I want to point out one thing here and we can learn a lot from this. Instead of taking Holy Scripture and saying, well, this is a mistake because it, they didn't quote it exactly word for word, identical. But this is the way translations work because it is identical. But what the, and here's the point that I'm going to point out here. In Psalm 2, it says, uh, in verse 2, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Okay? But when they quoted it in Acts chapter 4, they said in verse 26, the kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. So instead of anointed, they used the word Christ. That's not an error. Because the word Christ means the anointed one. So when you see, and, and, and this is important to take these and, and you get this learning and understanding when you read the Bible. And this is why the King James Bible is so important to have because the modern translations, you lose this stuff. They, they don't translate it properly. They change things. And, the, and I didn't look this up specifically to see what, if this was changed or how this appears. Um, but what they, what they try to do oftentimes in the modern version, they'll say, and against his anointed, to be like, oh, well, they, they, you know, we need to make this match up exactly. And then you lose the learning of someone who doesn't know Hebrew and doesn't know Greek as their native tongue, but they know English, 
and they have God's word and you can make these connections and say, oh, okay, well, this is what it means because I'm going to use the Bible as my dictionary. And when I see them quoting this over here and they're both, in, they're both scripture, they're both written in God's word, there is no contradiction. Well, these mean the same thing. It's a synonym. So when it's being written down against the Lord and against his Christ, Christ means the anointed. And we see elsewhere in scripture that Christ means Messiah. So Christ, anointed, Messiah, all of the same meaning. They're just different words that's used for the same exact thing, the same exact concept. And um, Christ is the anointed one. And, and when you read the Old Testament, you actually see a lot more references to the anointed one. So keep that in mind. Je that's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the anointed one. They just, I mean, that's why you don't, like, how often do you see the word Christ in the Old Testament? Never. Does that mean Jesus isn't mentioned or the Messiah or, you know, the anointed one? No, of course it is. They're just using different words. So uh, keep that in mind and, and hopefully you get a little bit of knowledge that you didn't have before tonight. Look at uh, verse number 27 in Acts chapter 4. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou, and again, whom thou hast anointed, Right? Even further, they just said, and against his Christ, which was the anointed, quoted in Psalm 2, from a truth, against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. They mentioned by name, Herod, Pontius Pilate, Gentiles, and the people of Israel, which is why did the heathen reign? The people imagine a vain thing. The people would be the Gentiles and the people of Israel. And the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers took counsel. Who are that? Pontius Pilate, Herod, right? Those are the rulers. And then the chief priests, the Pharisees, were also rulers. And they were all conspiring together and raging and taking counsel against the Lord and against his anointed or against Jesus Christ. Amazing. I, I love seeing all the parallels in here. Now, verse number three there in Psalm 2 talks about the heathen then wanting to cast away their cords from us. So what it is that the heathen really don't like, it's basically they don't want God and they definitely don't want the God of the Bible, the Lord, the boss, to tell them right from wrong and to tell them that they're in sin and to tell them that they can't do whatever they want to do. That's why they rage. That's why they imagine these vain things and, and they are totally anti-Christ and against the things of God because they can't stand the fact of someone telling them what to do. And it's the same way today. The, the vast majority of people that are atheists, that don't want to believe in God, and especially, you know, that God of the Bible, they're doing it because they don't want to be, I'll put it as, as the Bible says, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. What are the cords? This is, this is a level of control, right? It's a level of, of God saying, this is right, this is wrong. Here are my laws, keep my commandments. Oh, I don't want the bondage. I don't want, I don't want to, to, to have that. So they just get angry about it. And it's the truth, so they can't argue against it. So they, do, they resort to threatenings and fear. And, and physical harm because it makes them so angry to think that there's a real God out there who has commandments and is going to tell them what to do and they want to have nothing to do with it. Uh, let's go back to Psalm chapter 2. Let's keep reading here in Psalm 2. Because the heathen can rage all they want. They can get as upset as they want to get. They can, they can threaten. They could do all these different things. But you know what that does to God? Nothing. We're going to see God's response to the heathen's rage. I mean, think about it. As, as a human being, when somebody's raging, just really angry and stuff, as another person, you might have a tendency to be like, whoa, or be put in fear for your own safety and things like that. Wow, this guy's really upset. I'm not going to do anything to set him off. I'm not going to, you know mess with him, I'll just stay away from them or whatever, right? That's the reaction that we would have when someone's just raging. But that's not the reaction that God has. God's not going to be like, oh, I better walk on eggshells around this guy or else he might rage. 
because he's God, okay? And God doesn't cower to anybody and he's not intimidated by anybody, no matter how much they scream and yell and raise their voice and, and throw a fit and get angry and make threatenings and cursings. You know, people can be cursing God out all day and night and telling them what, how big and tough they are and what they're going to do to God. Let's see what God's reaction is to these people. Look at verse number four of Psalm 2. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. They're a big joke. It's just a joke to him. He doesn't care. He's, <laughs> look, look, look at this. This verse is raging. He actually thinks that that, that means anything. To me, it's going to move me at all with his rage. He's going to laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Verse number five. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath. And then he's going to get angry. He's going to laugh at them at first. And then he's going to get angry. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. And this reminds me of Proverbs 1. Right? The people that, that refused wisdom and instruction. And he says, you know what? When your fear cometh, as desolation and, you know, and, and the trouble and anguish come upon you as a whirlwind, he says, you know what? Then I'm going to laugh. I'm going to mock when your fear cometh. That's what he says. He says, I'm going to make fun of you. Why? Because you refused me. Because I held out my hand and you refused. And that's the attitude. And look, you don't, I don't care if you like it or not. That's who God is. And that's what the Bible tells us about God. That is, that is who God is. And no amount of raging is going to change God's mind or attitude on anything. In fact, he just looks at people and laughs. And, and people have a tendency not, especially like the atheists, people get so lifted up and, and full of themselves. Oh, I'll never bow my knee to anybody. I don't know. You better believe you will. The Bible says that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And you know when that's going to happen? That's going to happen after most of these people are spending some time in hell. Because if, you're, if you die a proud, arrogant jerk that that's, doesn't give any regard to the Lord and doesn't accept the gift of, of eternal life, then that's where they're going. And when you are being burned and tortured and tormented in a, in a literal fire of hell, that will humble you. You won't want to be in there very long. You're, you're a tough attitude and oh, I don't, I'm going to be ruling in hell. No, you won't. You've made up some fantasy in your head where you think you're not going to be burned and hurt by hell and you will. And I don't care who the toughest guy in the world is. There's no way that you're going to be too tough for hell and that hell's not going to have an impact on you because it will be crying like little babies, literally weeping and wailing and screaming out in torment and torture and their their real tough attitude is going to be squashed instantly when they find themselves in hell and it's not something that i'm um, reveling in it's sad and that's why we go out soul winning because we don't want people to have to face that but it's the truth and people need to recognize it as such and the heathen need to understand hey god is real and he's true and this is who he is the bible tells us all about him and you better recognize that or else you're going to find this same punishment. You're going you're gonna to find out for yourself who God really is. And it's better not to find out the hard way. And so let's keep reading here. Verse number six. The Bible says, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill. Well, before I even get into this, I, I don't want to forget about this point. You know, with God and who God is in the reality, we went out soul winning last week um, with a visitor that came from Colorado. I went out soul winning. We talked to a guy who's a Buddhist. And he's just like, it, it's, to me, it's always a little comical when I, when I run into like a total white guy, like an American guy that's a Buddhist. Like, I have a little bit more understanding when, when people of Asian descent that maybe grew up with that and that was part of their culture and part of their family and they take on their culture's religion. Like, that kind of makes sense to me that, that that would happen. But to find like these random white guys that are just like, oh, I'm a Buddhist. And uh, anyways, it, it was, that was kind of funny. But we're talking to this guy, and I was really trying to get through to him. And one of the things that he said, and this was not unique to him, I've heard this before, and it's a cute little saying, and you know what, and it sounds great, 
So when you're reading your little Proverbs of Buddha or whatever, I, and I don't know if this is a Buddhist thing or not, doesn't matter. It, I've heard this before. I don't think it's, it's exclusive to that. But where he says, well, I don't, make, I don't think it's a good thing to, to make decisions based off of fear. Like, I, I, you know, we've done that before, and I don't, th I don't think that that's, like, fulfilling or whatever, right? It's like, well, who cares what you think? It's the truth is the truth. But I explained to him, I was like, well, look, fear isn't always a bad thing. We have a fear for a reason. It's not just, you know, and, and he's, he's trying to be, make it sound like, oh, you're just being, you know, well, there's this hell and you don't want to go there, so you just have to accept this. And it's this whole fear tactic. And I go, look, it's reality. It's reality. It's, it's, it's the way things are, okay? Whether you like it or not, this is the way things are. So you make your decisions. I said, fear isn't always a bad thing. What about if someone goes to the Grand Canyon and is standing right over by the edge? A lot of people aren't going to want to get that close out of fear. And you know what? That's a good fear to have. It's a good thing not to just go walking over and you see all these loose stones and everything right at the edge of the Grand Canyon. And it's going to be sure death if you fall over the edge to not get right up to that edge and tempt the fate. No, Having that little bit of fear of, of not wanting to fall down there, a gust of wind or something else, you slip, that's good. It's for your own benefit. It's for your own protection to have that type of a fear. And, I mean, he didn't, and, and when I said it, he didn't really have anything to say. He was like, well, yeah, there's some of you. I was like, and this is the same way, okay? There's a reality. There's this place called hell. And it's full of fire and brimstone and burning and torture, torment. And people who don't receive Jesus Christ as their Savior are going to go there. It's a wise thing to make that decision to avoid a place of hurt. It's just as wise as, it's even more wise than the decision to not get too close to something that you know is going to cause you pain, is going to maybe take your life away. The decision to not put my hand on a burning hot stove. I'm afraid I'm going to get burned. Yeah, I will get burned. Well, the decision to put your, your faith in Christ, it's not a bad thing if fear is a motivating factor. You say, well, I just don't want to go to hell. Well, praise God. Amen. You realize that it's true. And Jesus Christ is offering you complete forgiveness of your sin. See, they want to just focus on, oh, well, this is just some fear tactic and ignore the fact that, no, you've sinned. You've done wrong. You brought this on yourself. It's not that God is just going to punish the just person, the person who didn't sin against him, who didn't bring it on themselves, who isn't responsible for their own actions. No, he brings it on those who do things on their own, who should know better, and they have done, they have made their own bed, and they would get a just judgment. That's the fact. So yeah, it sounds real. Oh, I don't make my decisions based on fear. Well, that's just stupid. That's just ignorant and dumb. And that's the philosophy you want to follow for the rest of your life, then, you know, I'm sorry for you. Now, I didn't talk to him the same way that I'm preaching right now, obviously. You know, I, you were trying to reach people and you don't talk to people at the door. This is a soul winning tip, okay, for the, for the evening. The, the, the things that you heard, you hear preached from behind the pulpit and the hard preaching and, and the, the points being made in maybe a more dramatic fashion is not the way that you speak to someone at the door, okay? Use discretion, use some wisdom, and I know everyone here does that, but I just want to make that point because uh, it's important. We, you know, we're, we're, we, we do care about these people. I care about that guy. You know, I'm bringing it up as an example because I've heard that before. It's not anything new to him. But we need to understand who God is and everybody needs to get a clear picture of who God is and what reality actually is. What is the truth? Well, the truth is found in God's word. And in, in, in this Bible, the Bible, tells us all about God and who he is. And it doesn't matter if you like him or not. It doesn't matter. It doesn't change facts. It doesn't change the truth. The truth is the truth. And the heathen don't like it, but they can't change it. Let's keep reading here in Psalm 2. Look at verse number 6. The Bible says, yeah, and this is where we're going to get into to some of the, the end times prophecy here in Psalm 2. Um, and, and it all still goes together, so don't forget the, um, 
you know, the, the, the rulers taking counsel together against the Lord and against his Christ. And then God responding, he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. He shall speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sword of displeasure. Verse 6, yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Now, setting up the king. Turn if you would to Acts chapter 13, because we're going to go to Acts 13. But setting up as king, Jesus Christ, this is referring to, to Jesus Christ being set up as king on the holy hill of Zion. When he first came to this earth, was he here as the king? No, he came as a servant, right? Now, at his second coming, he's coming back as the king to take his kingdom and to rule and to reign, right? That is coming in the future. But right now, or, or the, first, the first time he came, he wasn't set up as king. So the reason I'm bringing this up is because we, I, I want to make sure, this is another doctrinal issue, that we understand what the Bible's talking about when the Bible says, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Because that phrase, this day have I begotten thee, some people could be confused about, and they think that this is referring to Jesus Christ's birth. Because normally when we're reading about begets and begetting and someone being begotten, it's they're born from, right? That's, that's, that's who they were brought forth from, that the, those are ancestor or descendant from, that they've begotten, okay? And it still doesn't change that Jesus Christ was begotten, but this isn't referring to his physical birth from Mary. And I'm going to prove that to you. Look at it in Acts chapter 13. Because what this is really talking about is his resurrection. It was his being begotten from the dead. He's the first begotten of the dead. He's the first one that's brought forth. Jesus Christ is the first one that, that has died and then was brought back to life in his glorified body. Now you could say, well, wait a minute, other people have died and been brought back to life, like um, Lazarus, for example, right? And other people in the Bible have been brought back to life. But see, they were all brought back to life to die again. So they weren't brought back in their glorified state. They still had the same flesh and still ended up dying. When at the resurrection, we'll be brought forth to die no more. We're going to be raised up incorruptible. So they, when they were raised back from the dead, they still were corruptible. Their flesh still saw corruption. But Jesus Christ did not. So that's why he's the first begotten. We're going to see these scriptures. I just want to prove this to you. Because it's not clear just from Psalm 2-7 that this is what it's referring to. Now, um, the fact that it's starting to go into him being a king and stuff is a little bit of an indication, but that's not full, solid evidence. Look at Acts 13, verse number 32. The Bible says, And we declare unto you glad tidings how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again. So this is talking about his resurrection, right? So it's in verse 32, it's talking about the, pro the promise was made to the fathers, and this promise is being fulfilled unto the children of the prophets, right? The prophets proclaimed, hey, there's a promise, the promise of God. God has made a promise unto you. It's a covenant, right? It's a promise. And we need to have faith in that promise, right? God's fulfilled that promise unto us, the children of the disciples, or the children, excuse me, of the prophets, in that he hath raised up Jesus. Again, he fulfilled his promise. At the resurrection of Jesus Christ, as it is also written in the second psalm. And now, you, you know, most of the time you're going to see, I think just about every time it's saying, you know, David hath said, or referring to the psalm as a whole, or something like that. This one tells us it's the second psalm. This one's actually numbering it out. Like, this is the same one that we are going through tonight. It's the second psalm. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, he said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. The promise was fulfilled at the resurrection of Christ, and then they quoted Psalm 2, this day have I begotten thee, referring to his resurrection, not his birth at all. The whole context there in, in this passage in Acts 13 is all about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's a fulfillment. 
That's a fundamental prophecy, and that's him being brought up to the dead. You say, well, yeah, but why does it say he's begotten? Because he's begotten of the dead. He's brought forth from the dead. Because Jesus Christ was, was dead for three days and three nights. He was dead. When he died, his body was put in a tomb and his soul went to hell. He was dead in every meaning of the word before his resurrection on the third day. Turn if you would to Revelation chapter 1. We're, we're just going to see a little bit more proof because I, I want to, you know, this is, this is a doctrinal issue and I just want to make sure people understand this and you don't get confused about this and you see enough evidence to convince you. Revelation chapter 1. Verse number four, the Bible reads, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you in peace from him which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead. So right there, you see the phrase, it's not just me making this up. Oh, he's the first begotten of the dead. I mean, this is, this is what scripture says. This is what Revelation 1 says, that he is the first begotten of the dead. And the reason why he's the first is because we will be begotten of the dead. Also, at the resurrection, at his coming, all of us will, will have a resurrection. Whether we're alive and remain or whether we die before that day of, of the Lord Jesus Christ comes, we will uh, be resurrected and given our new bodies and be like Jesus and we'll see him as he is. For we shall be like him. the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our, own, from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Turn if you would to Hebrews chapter one. Go back a few, just a little bit to Hebrews chapter one. I think we got a little bit of time. I'm going to go through this. I'm going to go through this kind of, kind of briefly, but Hebrews 1 is making a different point than Jesus Christ being the first begotten of the dead, but it still brings up um, the statement, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Okay. And we're going to read this in context starting in verse number 1, Hebrews 1. The Bible says, God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, and again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. Now, there's a few things I, I kind of wanted to cover with this, but um, where do I want to start? One is that being begotten at the resurrection, you know, we will become fully a child of God. Like we're a child of God in our, in our spirit right? Because we're born again and the Spirit's born of that seed. But we're still groaning in ourselves until the redemption of our body. And that's when we fully will be, you know, our salvation will be complete as it were. Not that salvation's a process of like us doing good works. No, we're already saved. The, 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 the events are going to happen, but at a future date, we will get our body. And that's when we will receive the full adoption of being called the sons of God. Because this, this wicked flesh will be changed and we can fully enjoy being a child of God in, in that regard. Because right now, I mean, we got the flesh, which is kind of holding us back from walking in the spirit as a child of God. But, um, and this is talking about, in Hebrews 1, about angels. 
And people have this weird view when they read, like, you know, Genesis chapter 6, and they have this, this, they call it Nephilim. It's really just the giants. The English word is giants. You don't have to use a Hebrew word to try to impress people or try to make something sound like it's something different than what it says in English. We don't need that extra tidbit or anything. It's, it's just speak English. You don't know Hebrew, so don't go around using the Hebrew words for something that's just written in English, giants. When there's giants in the earth in those days, and they try to, to say that, oh, the, the sons of God were angels. Well, Hebrews chapter 1, what we just read here, is a very, very clear passage that the angels were never called the sons of God. Now, we are called sons of God when we're believing on Jesus Christ, right? As believers, we can be referred to as sons of God. But the Bible says, Unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son? So when did God ever say to an angel, Thou art my son? He Never. He didn't. This day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. There is a father-son relationship between God the Father and Jesus Christ. And he doesn't have a father-son relationship with the angels. He has a father-son relationship with us and our spirit when we're you know, being born again. He does not have a father-son relationship with the unsaved. Why? Even though they're his creation, just like the angels are, he doesn't have a father-son relationship. Because a father loves his children and he's never going to cast them into the fire. But those that are not his children, the bastards, he will throw into the fire. Anyways, I, just, I wanted to make that point. Turn if you would to Hebrews chapter 5 now because I don't want to get too far removed from that and go on the whole giants thing. It's just, it's just irritating when I hear people talking about that and, and they're just talking from ignorance. The angels are not God's sons. I have all, you could go back. If, if you want to hear more on that, go check out my Genesis 6 sermon where I covered that in detail and went to Job and I went to all the references that these people like to use to try to, to form their argument that angels are the son of God when we clearly have verses that say that they're not. Hebrews chapter 5, look at verse number 4. The Bible says, And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made in high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. Um, again, and I just wanted to throw out there as a last reference. You could look that up later. Um, turn, if you would, to Revelation chapter 2. I'm going to read for you from Psalm 2. You don't have to turn back to Psalm 2. We read the whole chapter already. And we're going to get into even more in depth now we, we, about the prophecy. So we saw about um, the king being placed in Jerusalem, right, in, in his holy mount in Psalm 2. And um, I'll just reread that verse again real quickly. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. So the king's going to be there. Jesus Christ is going to be set there. And then in Psalm 2, 8, the Bible says, Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Right? This is Jesus Christ inheriting all these things and, and being given the whole earth as his possession. Right? The heathen for his inheritance, the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. When Jesus Christ comes back, the Bible says he is going to rule with a rod of iron. And we're going to be ruling and reigning with him with a rod of iron. And people, you know, again, it's this, this nonsense of, oh, well, the New Testament, you know, you guys still look at the Old Testament commandments and the laws and stuff, and you don't realize that we're free from the law and that God doesn't want these things. You know, it's like, no. Look, these commandments, the God's law the law of the land that he laid out of the way things were supposed to be and the punishments and everything else that was supposed to be meted out is still righteous. It's just as righteous as it ever was. God's the one who determined the righteousness of his law. And when Jesus Christ come back and sets up his king, see, we don't have all of God's laws instituted today. Why? Because God's not ruling and reigning on the earth. But you know what? One day Jesus Christ will rule and reign on the earth and that's why he's going to be ruling and reigning with a rod of iron because it's not going to be flexible and bendable. It's going to be solid and strong and God's word will stand. 
and we're going to finally see the way things ought to have been from the beginning, the way that God intended things to be before people screwed it up with all their sin. Revelation chapter 2, look at verse number 26. We're going to see some references to this as being an, a prophetic end times event from Psalm 2 of, of ruling with a rod of iron or breaking them with a rod of iron. Verse number 26, And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers even as I received of my Father. So this is Jesus Christ speaking and saying, I received this to rule and reign with a rod of iron from my Father, and he's also going to give it to them that overcome it and keep it my works unto the end. That's a reward that people are going to get for doing right and keeping their faith and keeping the works that God has for them unto the end. He says, I'm going to give you power over nations. And you see that also in the Gospels when Jesus is speaking the parables, and, and, you know, the, the servants that, that made money with the talents. And he says, well done, done, thou good and faithful servant. You know, you've been faithful in that which is little. I'll, I'll give you, um, you shall rule over, you know, and, and I'm kind of mixing the parables in my head right now. I realize that, you know, you're going to rule over five cities. You're going to rule over 10 cities. These are real rewards that believers are going to get. The ones that have overcome and, and keep the works unto the end. Those that don't keep the works, they're still saved, but they're not going to be the ones ruling and reigning. Like I said, they're, they're saved. They're going to be doing something else, but, but this is one of the rewards that's, that's meted out. Revelation chapter 12, flip over to Revelation chapter 12, and we'll see verse number 5. If you remember the way the Revelation works, the first 11 chapters kind of go in order, and then we kind of start back over with Revelation chapter 12. In the beginning, it talks about the, the woman bringing forth a child and the serpent coming, you know, trying to, to destroy the child and stuff like that. That's the context of Revelation 12. We're just going to look at verse number 5 where it reads, And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. So that child there is referring to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the one who, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. He is that king. Verse no, or chapter number 19. Turn, if you would, to Revelation 19. I just want to show this, that you know these references from Psalm 2 and the prophetic uh, meaning that's behind there. Revelation 19, verse number 13. Another description of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse number 13. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron." And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords, Jesus Christ, ruling and reigning with a rod of iron when his millennial kingdom is set up, when he's set up as king in the holy mount Zion. is literally where he's going to be ruling and reigning from. And we're going to finally see, and what a great thousand years this is. It's going to be a thousand years of peace. And we're going to see the way things ought to have been. And when God's law is just fully instituted and he's ruling righteously and reigning, what a great time of prosperity that's going to be. That's going to be a time where you will be able to, to leave your doors unlocked and your windows open and whatever and experience the peace that comes through God's law because he's going to be ruling with a rod of iron. And there are going to be still unsaved people that have made it through the, the tribulation and God's wrath. When God pours out his wrath on the earth, it's not completely destroyed. And not every soul is going to die. Now, I don't know exactly how many people are going to be left. We don't know that. But there are going to be people who didn't take the mark of the beast, but didn't get saved, that are still going to be alive, that didn't die in all of the wrath and, and, and everything else that happened. And they will be on this earth because that's the people who are going to be ruling and reigning over. It's going to be over all the nations. And, um, and it's going to be ruled with a rod of iron. And then, of course, at the, the last battle is when um, 
you know, Satan's going to be loosed after those thousand years out of hell. And that's, that's another great thing about the millennial reign is that Satan's going to be bound up and not causing any more problems and deceiving people on the earth because he's going to be bound in hell for those thousand years. So it's not until he's, he comes back up out of hell where he begins to deceive people again and then there's that final battle and they're all consumed like in an instant. And then we get the new heaven and new earth. And that's the way that the Bible goes. Psalm chapter 2, let's finish up this, this chapter here. Verse number 10. Psalm 2.10, Be wise now therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. God is a God to be feared. Kings, rulers, be instructed. Understand, don't be, like, don't be a heathen that rages against God because God's just going to laugh at you and mock you and have you in derision and cause bad things to happen. You better be afraid. You bet, you, serve the Lord with fear. I don't want to make decisions based off of fear. The Bible says serve the Lord with fear. And rejoice. Rejoice is being happy with trembling. Never let yourself get so comfortable with God that you lose your respect for him and and. You don't have that fear and trembling that we ought to have when we consider who God is. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. He said, you don't want to get God even a little bit angry. He says, kiss the son. You see Jesus Christ, you know, kiss him, greet him, welcome him. Don't snub him because you don't even want to get God angry a little bit. Have the fear and trembling enough to where you are, you are recognizing and respecting and, oh, sir, here, can I get you a, you know, that type of an attitude toward Jesus Christ. Because even just not greeting him, right, with a, with a kiss, just, he comes in, he's saying, kiss his son, lest he be angry, and you perish from the way and you die because you, God's wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Great psalm. I mean, did you realize there was that much packed into those 12 verses in Psalm 2? I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot there. And you know what? That's a simple song. But, you know, I'm just going to close on this. Let's focus on, on me me meditating and memorizing God's word. They did it in Jesus. They knew these psalms. And they recognized how applicable, these are applicable in your life. The heathen is still raging today. It's still truth and it still is, is out there today and, and applicable to everything. Let's, let's try to get these, not just the Psalms, but all of God's word, as much as is possible in our hearts to, to give us the extra insight and the extra knowledge and extra light on the things that are going on in this world. Because it'll help us. They recognize these things. And, and, it, and you know what it does? It helps embolden them. It helps strengthen them. And they see, wow, it's, and, and it's always amazing. Isn't it amazing when something happens and you see, you know what, this is exactly what the Bible says is true and, and the way things are. And then it's even more exciting when you can see those things and you don't like get involved in it because you already know and you'll be like, oh man, I've already learned this from the Bible. I'm not going to do this. And you see maybe someone else go along the same path and exactly what said, the Bible says they, they are part of and you are not because you have the wisdom found in Scripture. It's, it's incredible. And it's incredible just because it's true. It's real. It's the way it is. And it's amazing. And thank God for all of his truth. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for providing this great doctrine and the great content that is found in your words and that your words are perfect. And we can look at all these various places in Scripture, dear Lord, and unlike any other book in the entire world, your words fit together so perfectly and so completely. It, it truly is astonishing to us as it ought to be because these words are from you and not just from men. Lord, we, we thank you for providing us with this wisdom and instruction. Help us to uh, maintain a humble attitude and, and that we would uh, always be reverence and uh, always reverence you and respect you, dear Lord. And I pray that you would please help us to bring the glorious light of the gospel into this lost world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.